Hello everyone, welcome back to EEE 641, uh, Advanced Electromagnetic Field Theory. Uh, in today's lecture, lecture 17, uh, we are going to continue our discussion on spherical transmission lines and cavities. So in the previous lecture, lecture 16, uh, we constructed the solution of uh, uh, transmission lines, uh, how, how do we uh, get the solution uh, for the transmission lines or waves, uh, wave propagation inside spherically symmetric uh, uh, structures as a transmission line or even as a radiator. And we saw that uh, uh, there are two methods. Uh, one method is to, uh, you can have, uh, uh, you can solve that uh, geometry for TE to Z or TM to Z type of modes. And then you can use combination of TE to Z and TM to Z modes uh, to arrive at the final solution uh, for that geometry. The reason behind uh, why we cannot use TE to Z or TM to Z mode directly to uh, explain or express the wave propagation for those geometry is that uh, uh, those modes are not conformal to the uh, spherical geometry. So for that, uh, we need to have something like TE2R or TM2R or TEMR type of modes, uh, which are directly conformal to your spherical geometry. Now, uh, we also saw uh, those modes, uh, TE2R, TM2R, TEM2R. And we saw that uh, instead of using uh, th that compact wave vector uh, equation, we need to take one step back. Uh, we, uh, we do not use Lorentz condition. So uh, we get slightly more generalized uh, wave vector equation. And then when we solve that, we are able to get solutions for TE2R, TM2R, or in general TEM2R type of modes. Also, uh, if you remember, uh, when we constructed the solution, the eigenfunctions which we get uh, as a solution of those equations are basically uh, called Shokhanov's uh, functions. So uh, the functions which we get is Shokhanov's uh, uh, spherical Bessel function or Shokhanov's uh, spherical Henkel function if you are having a traveling waves. Now those uh, functions are basically in the radial direction. Uh, for the theta variations, uh, we get uh, uh, legendary associated legendary functions uh, as an eigenfunction. And for the phi variation, because it's a periodic, uh, it's going to have a periodic distribution after every two pi radians or after every 360 rotation in phi direction your functions uh, field functions field, uh, field vectors have to be periodic and as a result of that we use uh, cosine and sine function which are very simple uh, one of the simplest uh, periodic functions uh, so we uh, we went through all these details in the last lecture now in this lecture, what we are going to do is we are going to focus on the applications of uh, uh, this kind of geometries or solutions for this kind of geometry. So we are going to consider uh, primarily two type of uh, structures. One is a biconical antenna as a radiator and the other one is a spherical cavity. So you use this kind of spherical shaped cavity uh, or even hemisphere, upper hemisphere as a cavity for many applications uh, 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 where they are being used as a resonator or even for dielectric resonating antennas. So uh, we will cover that spherical cavities as well as we will also see biconical antenna and we will see that uh, this kind of geometries, uh, biconical antennas or even bow tie antennas, they, why do they act like, uh, uh, why do they behave like uh, ultra wideband antenna in terms of impedance bandwidth they have a very huge or very large bandwidth so we will see uh, the reason behind that uh, why do they behave like this ultra wideband antenna compared to your conventional dipole antenna so uh, let's start this lecture lecture 17 and we will go through this two geometry and see how and why do they behave in such particular uh, in such particular way so first of all, we will start our uh, discussion with biconical transmission line. So 
uh, as I mentioned, uh, for biconical transmission line, uh, uh, since it has a spherical uh, symmetry, uh, we are going to use TE2R, TM2R, or TEMR type of modes to explain the wave propagation for this kind of uh, uh, wave guides or transmission line. So this is the geometry uh, where basically you have uh, two angles, alpha one. From the z axis, you can see that uh, the upper uh, cone makes the alpha one angle and the lower cone makes the alpha two angle, okay? So those are the two uh, angles uh, which will define our geometry. And again, this biconical transmission line is centered around our uh, coordinate system, okay? Now, this is a biconical antenna, something similar to your biconical transmission line. Now you have biconical antenna and uh, it has this uh, opening angle of alpha. Okay, so in each side uh, around z axis, it has an alpha by two opening angle and it is fed by a uh, transmission line here. And this is our source of energy. So this is the another geometry here. Biconical transmission line uh, is not actually transmission line, but it is a radiator. It's acting like a biconical uh, antenna. So we are going to see what will be the solution for this kind of geometry. So again, as I just mentioned that uh, uh, this biconical antenna uh, can be uh, put into a category of frequency independent antenna and we will see why we can consider that as a frequency independent antenna. Uh, some other uh, frequency independent antennas are spiral antenna. Okay, again, this is a spiral antenna is an extension of uh, uh, loop antenna. So loop antenna is not a, a broadband or ultra broadband antenna, but uh, when you make a spiral out of that loop, basically you will have a much broader uh, antenna uh, in terms of impedance bandwidth. Uh, similarly, biconical antenna or bow tie antenna uh, compared to your conventional dipole antenna, they will have much broader bandwidth. And we will see that in this lecture that why does they, why do they behave like that? Uh, the another uh, antenna which is, uh, which can be considered as a frequency independent antenna or semi frequency independent antenna is log periodic antenna. So in log periodic antenna, basically uh, your impedance varies uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, as a in a logarithmic fashion as a function of frequency. And that's why it is called log periodic uh, antenna. And we'll see that uh, uh, most probably will not discuss, we will not go into de uh, detail because this kind of antennas actually you study in another course uh, at Arizona State University. Uh, which is Tripoli 543, second course on antennas. So where you uh, study all this kind of geometries which behave as a uh, frequency independent antenna or semi-frequency independent antenna. But in today's lecture, we will be focusing primarily on biconical antenna since biconical antenna has a spherical symmetry or it has a spherical uh, geometry. So this is uh, uh, another uh, type of biconical uh, antenna. It's like a dipole antenna, but now instead of having that entire structure, conical structure in three dimension, now you are just uh, uh, implementing in two dimensional. So this kind of antenna because of its shape is also called bow tie antenna. So again, it behaves similar to bow, uh, biconical antenna. It again has a, a much broader bandwidth than your conventional, uh, this, uh, dipole antenna where you have rectangular strip, okay? So here you have uh, like a triangular uh, sides, uh, both sides are triangular uh, in your ant dipole antenna and that's why because of its shape, we call that as a bow tie antenna. Uh, again, uh, this is an extension of your bow tie antenna. So uh, like uh, uh, for dipole, uh, the counterpart, you can always have a monopole antenna, which all, uh, which has almost a similar behavior as dipole antenna. Here also, uh, something similar to biconical antenna, you can have cone monopole antenna, or even you can have a, a, something like a monopole, planar monopole antenna with a triangular uh, shape uh, as a counterpart of your uh, bow tie antenna. And again, these uh, antennas behave uh, like uh, broadband antennas compared to 
conventional dipole or monopole antenna which are like a resonant antenna they they have a very narrow bandwidth in terms of impedance bandwidth so uh, for the bow tie antenna this is the structure which i have been uh, mentioning so similar to uh, biconical antenna for bow tie antenna it's a planar structure but uh, again it has the similar uh, uh, symmetry okay and this is another example of uh, or practical example of bow tie antenna so bow tie antenna or dipole antenna they are balanced structure you have two different potentials uh, one uh, one hand is positive the other hand is uh, negative potential negative potential so they are basically a balanced uh, antenna or balanced structure now when you are trying to fit them using uh, let's say uh, let's say a uh, microstrip line here you can see that you have some kind of microstrip line or type of uh, 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 transmission line which is feeding uh, this antenna since it is not uh, 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 since uh, this kind of uh, or many of these uh, transmission lines are not uh, uh, balanced transmission line uh, what you need to do is this transmission lines are basically nothing but uh, unbalanced transmission lines many of them and as a result of that you need uh, something called balun uh, uh, where you have balance and unbalance so you need this balun uh, for your uh, feeding network uh, before the antenna so that you can connect balance system to unbalanced system or balanced device to unbalanced device here our feeding uh, transmission line is unbalanced and on the other hand your antenna is uh, uh balanced structure or balanced uh, uh, device again this is a current distribution and we will see in this lecture uh, towards the end that uh, basically from this uh, by uh, uh, by looking at the current distribution on antenna you can have a, a much better idea or much better understanding of what is happening and you can improvise your antenna you can improve the performance of your antenna by uh studying this current distribution on these antennas okay and this is a good practice to observe or study the current distribution for any antenna so that you can have a better idea what is going on and this is a reference and again as i mentioned we are going to uh, see additional material on this topic towards the end of the lecture and i will show some slides based on this and this is a reference from which we have uh, uh, taken this figure so coming back to biconical structures as an antenna or transmission line basically uh, as i uh, showed you last time it is uh, better to use te2r tm2r or tem2r type of modes so we saw that uh, what is what are the possible eigen functions in the last lecture that can solve those equations for spherical geometry for this kind of modes and those are the shokhanov's uh, spherical bessel function and henkel function uh, for r variation for theta variation those variations were associated legendre functions and for phi variation again those variations were explained using cosine and sine variations sine functions so let's start uh, uh, deriving expressions for te to r mode so for te to r mode as you uh, as we have gone through this uh, uh, exercise multiple times many times uh, in the previous uh, geometries basically you first solve this uh, uh, some kind of vector wave equation this vector wave equation is similar to our uh, hemhole scalar wave equation uh, but now instead of that uh, uh, hemhole type of equation you have slightly modified uh, scalar wave equation and this wave equation we arrived at this wave equation if you remember in the last lecture from something like a vector wave equation without lorentz condition okay it was without lorentz condition because if you remember when we try to uh, separate this three uh, scalar wave equation from compact uh, wave vector equation we were not able to uncouple three different components r theta and phi we were not able to uncouple those components for the potential as a result of that it became very difficult to solve those equations directly as a result of that what we did is we took one step backward 
uh, we didn't use Lorentz condition for defining scalar potential psi, uh, and uh, based on that, we we basically modified or generalized our vector wave equation, and then we showed that actually by doing that, we were able to uh, uh, come up with a scalar wave equation, which was nothing but this equation. Okay. This is 10.36, that's the equation which we derived last time. For te to r, you will have f of r, which is going to be non-zero. All the uh, other components of f vector potential will be zero, as well as uh, for the a vector potential, all the components will be zero. Okay, that's what you can see here for te to r type of modes. So, uh, again, using method of separation of variable, you can represent this fr, uh, one particular component of your vector potential f, uh, as a multiplication of uh, three uh, separate uh, functions, f of r, g of theta, and h of phi. So this, this is based on method of separation of variable. And you can, uh, we, we showed last time that f of r, the variations in the r direction will be explained by either Henkel function or Bessel function, but these are not the normal uh, Bessel and Henkel function. These are Shokhanov's spherical Bessel function, Shokhanov's uh, spherical Henkel function. And those are represented by capital letters with hat on top of that. Okay. So as you can see that uh, since we are now looking at the uh, radiating fields uh, for biconical antenna, we are looking into radiating fields. Uh, we are going to use Henkel function. So uh, we are simply using Henkel function for the traveling waves in the radial direction R. In the theta direction, we have uh, uh, this one format uh, where we have legendary uh, function of the first kind. Uh, with cosine theta argument and minus cosine theta argument. Okay, so this is one form of uh, uh, one particular form where we are using only first kind of uh, legendary functions, associated legendary functions. But there was also another form we were, where we had uh, uh, combination of first kind and second kind of uh, uh, associated legendary functions. Uh, and we will see that uh, we will actually use that. Uh, for solving for TEM modes. We will see that in the coming slides. Uh, similarly, for phi variations, we use uh, cosine and sine function, and uh, basically combination of cosine and sine function. Again, why? Because we have a periodic uh, behavior in the phi direction. In the azimuthal direction, basically we have a periodic uh, uh, function for the field vector. So once you solve, once you have the eigenfunction, for your vector potential f, and that is fr in our case, uh, what you can do is you can use these equations to solve for E and H field for, uh, for the corresponding uh, wave vector f. And from that, you can see that er is going to be zero, which makes sense because we are solving for te to r mode, transverse electric to radial direction. That means your E vector in the radial direction should be zero. So er is zero and other five components, e theta, e phi, and h r, h theta, and h phi can be uh, written in this format, right? By We have done this thing again and again. We are doing the same equation. Like once you have f vector potential, you can solve e and h using that uh, vector wave potential for t to r mode. Now, when you do that, uh, and what we are going to do is we are uh, going to now enforce boundary conditions for our particular geometry. Once you have the possible eigenfunction and once you have the uh, uh, possible field distribution, uh, what you do is you enforce boundary condition for your geometry. So in our case, basically our E phi, okay, E phi at theta equals to alpha one and theta equals to alpha two should vanish. Why? Because the tangential component, tangential component of your E field must vanish on the perfectly electric conductor. Now, in our biconical antenna geometry, this is our geometry. So, as you can see that uh, at theta equals to alpha 1, that is this one, 
uh, your e phi component okay that is going to be something like this okay so this e phi component is a tangential component on your cone so that component has to vanish the other component which is tangential to your biconical antenna is er right er also is also a tangential component to your biconical structure pec boundary or pec surface however since we are already using te to r mode we are solving for te to r mode uh, er component is already zero everywhere because it's te to r mode er component is already zero so we cannot use that we we are not going to get any extra information from that so uh, what happens is uh, basically uh, we have to uh, enforce that boundary condition only on e phi we can get we can enforce on both but the thing is additional information uh, we will get only from e phi component because er component is already zero everywhere for uh, te to r mode so as a result of that uh, when you apply those boundary condition at theta equals to alpha 1 and theta equals to alpha 2 uh, for those two boundary conditions you will come up with these two equations okay this will be your two equations in terms of uh, associated legendary uh, uh, functions now uh, what you can do is we can solve this simultaneously by taking a determinant of this so when you take the determinant of this and equate it to zero uh, this is again the geometry of our biconical transmission line or antenna and when you do that when you uh, uh, make or equate that determinant to zero this will be your equation okay this will be your equation uh, if you solve this equation you will be able to get eigenvalues of n so from this equation you can get the eigenvalues of n now the thing is it is very difficult to solve this equation or as i should not say it's very difficult but it's a slightly tricky task to complete uh, okay and as a result of that we are not going to go into the details of how to solve this right now in this lecture but basically you need to solve this equation in order to get the eigenvalues of n okay now uh, when you do that uh, basically what will happen is this will be your uh, uh equations first of all okay and from this equation you can write that in terms of this one so you can get b2 in terms of this expression now uh as a result of that this will be your uh vector wave potential uh fr uh, one particular com component of vector wave potential f uh, uh, which is uh, or which can be written in terms of this so this is your uh, eigen function and where basically m is uh, uh, integer values 0 1 2 3 okay positive integer values and uh, uh, we will see in the coming slides there are some uh, limitations on those values as well but as of now this is going to be your eigen function and you have to solve that and based on that uh, you will get uh, uh, fill distributions E and H fill uh, distribution for uh, uh, TE to R mode. Now, similarly, you can uh, follow the same procedure for TM to R mode. Now, instead of uh, non zero FR for TM to R mode, you are going to have AR potential non zero. Uh, so, uh, for TM to R mode, basically all the components of your vector potential F will be zero. And even for a vector potential, a theta and a phi will be zero. Only a r component is going to be non-zero. So what we are going to do is we are going to solve that uh, for uh, this particular equation. Okay, we are going to solve this particular equation, scalar wave equation uh, for a r. Okay, and once you solve that, we again saw that uh, for the r variation, you can. Uh, represent that uh, r variations using shokhanov's uh, spherical bessel function or henkel function uh, here we will use henkel function okay and for uh, uh, theta variations uh, you use associated legendary functions uh, p and q here we are using only p but uh, in the coming slides we will see that actually it is better to use uh, p and q both first and second kind of 
uh, associated legendary function and we will see that in the coming slide why it is a better option again for fee variation you since it's a periodic uh, uh, function in the fee direction your fills are going to be periodic in fee azimuthal direction uh, we can represent them in terms of cosine and sine function combination of cosine and sine functions so uh, again uh, once you have those fields uh, uh, sorry uh, vector wave potential a uh, you can use these uh, expressions to find the corresponding e and h field distribution and when you do that you can see that hr is going to uh, go to zero which makes sense right because we are solving for tm to r mode transverse magnetic radi uh, to radial direction so your hr should obviously be zero and the other five components which are non zero are this er h theta h phi and uh, h theta and h phi again you apply those boundary condition that at uh, e uh, at theta equals to alpha 1 and theta equals to alpha 2 your tangential component of e vector should go to zero or should vanish so e phi uh, has to vanish since it's a tangential component Uh, on the surface at theta equals to alpha one and theta equals to alpha two. Similarly, now we can also uh, apply similar boundary condition on ER component. Now your ER component is tangential to conical uh, structure. At the same time, it's non-zero. Here uh, for TM to R, HR is zero, not the ER. Uh, when we solve for TE to R mode, ER was zero. Here. ER is non-zero, so you can utilize this equation to get more information like eigenvalues. Uh, so we have two options now. We have I, uh, E phi as well as we have now ER. So when you do that and apply these boundary conditions, again you will come up with this equation in terms of associated legendary functions. And again, it's a tricky, uh, tricky equation to solve. Uh, we are not going to go into detail, uh, but when you do that, uh, basically this will be your uh, final eigen function for the vector wave potential uh, A, in, in particular A R. Okay, because A R is the only component which is non-zero. And again, uh, m values for m, basically eigen values for m will be all the uh, positive integers zero, one, two, three. and uh, now we will uh, see uh, the most important mode which is uh, basically a dominant mode you can consider that as a dominant mode uh, that is tem to r mode transverse electromagnetic to radial direction ter tem r modes and uh, we will see that basically tem to r modes are nothing but uh, te to 00 or tm 00 mode so it's a most fundamental or uh, first uh, mode for this kind of geometry and why do we have the why can this support uh, tem type of mode the reason is uh, it has two different potentials one is this one okay so whenever you have two potentials uh, those kind of structures can support tem mode Uh, we have seen this even in the previous structures when i mentioned coaxial cable coaxial cable has two uh, different conducting surfaces okay physically separated so it can support uh, two different potentials uh, electric potentials as a result of that it can support a tem mode or tem type of mode similarly even if you remember for co uh, for microstrip line uh, for uh, strip line all those modes uh, all those geometries can support tem mode uh, in contrast if you remember rectangular wave guide follow rectangular wave guide since it has only one uh, conductive surface okay uh, it cannot support tem mode so here since we have two uh, conductive surfaces separated apart uh, basically we can have uh, or this geometry can handle tem mode and as you can see that all this uh, dash line they denote the radiated wave front from this biconical antenna okay and this is the direction of wave propagation this is a wave vector 
okay all these small arrows are wave vector so again the lowest order or dominant mode for bioconical transmission line occurs when m and n both of them are zero okay so when we do that in our equation this was our equation okay so this was one of the equation and the other equation was this one okay now let's try to put m and n equals to 0 in this two equation and see what happens so uh, when we do that uh, again this is for te to r and this is for tm to r modes okay for te to r you have fr non zero and for tm to r ar is non zero now what happens is when we uh, enforce uh, eigenvalues of m equals to 0 and n equals to 0 uh, because of this uh, function this associated legendary functions uh, property all these functions okay <coughs> what happens is uh, whenever this uh, condition m greater than n your uh, legendary associated legendary function goes to zero okay that is one of the reason this is going to create a problem that your m if m is greater than n then your legendary functions will go to zero so in uh, in other words your m eigenvalues of n has to be smaller than or equal to n so this is always you uh, you will always have to follow this in order to have the non trivial solution otherwise you will get trivial solution your your potentials this potentials will go to zero okay both these potentials fr and ar they will go to zero now another important uh, uh, property is when you have uh, uh, m and n both equals to zero for associated legendary function basically it uh, goes to one okay it reduce down its value to one now uh, as a result of that again these are the two important conditions which will cause a problem okay these two conditions will cause us a problem one is this one and the other one is this one okay so as a result of that what will happen is basically uh, you have to have uh, you have to have uh, so what happens is basically that this p 0 0 cosine theta equals to 1 right now if you put that here okay basically they both of these terms will be identical and then they will cancel out each other so you will again get a trivial solution so in other words n cannot be zero so if your n is zero then this term entire term will go to zero okay and another uh, condition is m cannot be greater than n in order to have non zero values for your associated legendary function so these two conditions we need to keep in mind now the problem is when we enforce m equals to 0 and n equals to 0 as i just mentioned uh, your functions this uh, legendary functions uh, will go to zero or they will cancel each other out and as a result of that your vector wave potentials will uh, go to zero so you will have a trivial solution so we concluded that n cannot be zero and that's why if you use this particular uh, form of uh, uh, theta variation in terms of simply first kind of uh, legendary functions then you will not be able to come up with a non-trivial solution okay you will not be able to come up with a non-trivial solution if you use this so what we are going to do is instead of using these variations okay instead of using these variations for theta g theta we are going to replace that by this one uh, if you remember we had this another form where we have uh, both kind of uh, legendary functions uh, first kind of legendary function denoted by p and the second kind of legendary function is denoted by q so uh, by using this particular format 
now we know that uh, that we will be able to have this particular value which will be non zero so when we do that uh, for tm to r 0 0 basically m and n equals to 0 your ar potential will get reduced down to this one okay these are the functions you will get and now you have this one as a non zero now another thing will happen that uh, this uh, this legendary associated legendary function of second kind can be written as uh, can be written as this particular expression in terms of cosine theta okay and by using this uh, trigonometric identities for cosine theta you can write down that uh, uh, q0 cosine of theta that uh, associated uh, legendary function of second kind uh, in terms of cot theta by 2 in this expression okay and when you when you substitute that in your uh, vector wave potential along with uh, another uh, approximation that is asymptotic expression for uh, uh, Henkel function of second kind. So when you have uh, a large argument for your uh, Henkel function, basically Shokunov Henkel function, uh, uh, Shokunov spherical Henkel function uh, for the second kind, that is this H2, okay, H2, uh, what happens is uh, uh, you can write that uh, uh, Shokunov spherical Henkel function in terms of regular Henkel function, okay, of second kind. And uh, for regular Henkel function of second kind, when you have a large argument, uh, okay, you can write uh, that or you can approximate it by exponential function. And when you do this, some mathematical uh, modifications or manipulations, Basically, you come up with that when your BR, when your R is uh, radial distance is very large. That means you are observing your fields or potentials uh, in the far field for your biconical antenna. For radiators in general, we are interested in far field pattern in most of the cases. Okay, in some cases, it is required to you to analyze and study near field. Uh, of your antenna, what is the field distribution in the near field? But in most of the cases, you are interested in observing or studying uh, the far field radiation pattern of your antenna. So here, when we uh, impose that boundary condition, R tends to infinity, R is large. That means beta R is going to be large. Electrical uh, radial distance is going to be large. So for that, you can approximate your uh, Shokunov spherical Bessel function by this exponential function. Okay, and as a result of that, this will be your final vector wave potential for TM00 mode, TM to R00 mode. Okay, so you can see that in this expression in the far field, basically your vector wave potential is only having a theta variations. Okay only having a theta variation now what we are going to do is for again this te or tm to 0 0 r is nothing but tem to r mode okay dominant mode lowest order mode what we are going to do is once you have that vector wave potential uh, you can find corresponding e field right using this expression so this will be your er e theta and e phi now notice that uh, here you have dr square or del r square that means you have second order of differentiation with respect to r radial component now uh, as a result of that your er component will be much much smaller in the far field so er component is almost like a zero so we can approximate er to zero in the far field okay we are approximating that so as a result of that, you will have only e theta and e phi in the far field. Also, you can see that your e phi component is zero. E phi component is zero. That means you are only left with the e theta component. You have only e theta component and er component is approximately zero. 
Now, similarly, you can find the edge field corresponding to your A vector wave potential using this expression. And you can see that HR is zero, H theta is zero. You are only left with H phi component and which is expressed by this particular equation or expression. Okay. So this will be your expression for H phi in the far field. Now, what we can do is, if you remember, wave impedance is a ratio of E and H field. Okay. The only thing which you need to uh, make sure is that they are directing energy in the correct direction. Here in our case, we want that energy to be directed or radiated outward in the radial direction. That means that your pointing vector, pointing vector should be pointed or directed in the positive R direction. So your E theta and H phi, if we take a ratio of E theta and H phi, that will be directed in the radial direction. So if we take a ratio of that, it will give us the wave impedance in the positive R direction. And when we do that, we see that actually it is equal to intrinsic impedance of your media. That is intrinsic impedance of uh, uh, free space. Uh, if you have a free space as a media. And uh, if you remember, uh, only and only for TEM modes, uh, plane waves, uh, you can get this condition that your wave impedance is going to be equal to uh, intrinsic impedance. That means your waves are basically plane waves. They do not see any kind of boundary condition in the far field. Okay, so they are freely propagating, freely traveling in the media. So that's why uh, your wave impedance in the radial direction at very high values or at very large distance in the far field is going to approach towards the intrinsic impedance since it is a TEM to R mode. Okay, transverse electromagnetic to R mode. So that makes sense, right? that this your wave impedance go, uh, is approximately equals to eta in the far field. Now, uh, for the transmission line, for biconical type of transmission line, uh, we are interested more in the characteristic impedance of transmission line. For transmission line, we are more interested in characteristic impedance. Like we derive characteristic impedance uh, value for uh, microstrip line or for strip line. So. Again, uh, characteristic impedance can be defined by voltage and current ratio. Okay, now how do we find those voltage and current? So here we have two potential uh, surfaces. So we can find the potential difference between them. And for that, you have to integrate your E field from one surface to another surface. So we are going to integrate this E field. Okay, this E field. Uh, from this surface alpha 1 to alpha 2. So from that we will get Vr. So that is what we have done. Vr is basically integration of E dot dl from alpha 1 to alpha 2. And when you do that, this will be your expression for Vr. Now, uh, similarly, you can also integrate uh, H in a closed loop to get current, uh, corresponding current. So for that, you have to, again, if you look at this H phi, okay, they are creating this loop. So what we are going to do is we are going to integrate that H phi component on this biconical structure. Okay. And from doing that, by doing that from phi equals to zero to two pi, when you do that integration, we are going to get this expression for the IR. Now, using this definition of characteristic impedance, that it is a ratio of voltage and current, equivalent voltage and current. Uh, when we do that, we see that again, characteristic impedance for biconical transmission line also uh, reduced down to uh, something like input impedance and which we will see that uh, it only and only depends on, it only and only depends on alpha. It only depends on alpha one and alpha 2. So you can see that this kind of antennas or transmission line, uh, their input impedance, characteristic impedance, uh, they 
have this input impedance which is only and only function of alpha that means it does not depend on the frequency okay once you have uh, once you set the function alpha let's say alpha equals to 30 degree or 45 degree or 60 degree regardless of your rf frequency of operation your input impedance presented by this kind of geometry either biconical transmission line or antenna is going to be uh, remain unchanged okay they are going to be uh, they are going to remain unchanged and as a result of that this kind of structures can be considered as a frequency independent structures frequency independent uh, impedance uh, profile right so in terms of uh, impedance bandwidth okay they have uh, frequency independency and uh, that's why this kind of antennas are also considered frequency independent antennas in practical scenario because you are going to also terminate your structure in the radial direction here we do not uh, enforce any boundary condition in the radial direction okay we assume that uh, this biconical structure uh, extends infinitely in the radial direction but in practical scenarios you will not have infinitely large uh, biconical structures so when you have finite structure you are not going to see obviously uh, uh, frequency independent behavior however compared to conventional dipole antenna it will have a much broader bandwidth so you can have ultra wide band antennas using this kind of structure biconical antenna or bow tie antenna now again this is this is going to be your e field and h field distribution for this kind of antennas and corresponding equivalent voltages and current now uh, if you plot that input impedance uh, as a function of angle this will be your graph okay so your uh, as you vary your half cone angle alpha 1 then this will be your input impedance z in as a function of alpha 1 and again what we have done is uh, for this final expression this expression basically we assume that uh, your structure biconical structure is symmetric what do i mean by that basically your alpha 2 is equals to pi minus alpha 1 so those angles are the same alpha 1 uh, that opening angle uh, are the same as a result you will have a symmetrical structure so this opening and this opening will have the same opening angle now uh, now we will shift our focus to the second topic for this lecture that is spherical cavity so uh, compared to biconical antenna now what we are going to have is uh, basically we are going to have waves which will be bouncing back and forth inside the cavity or uh, basically resonator and uh, uh, now we have to analyze for q factor because we are looking for the cavity we are more interested in how well it behaves uh, as a resonator and uh, we will characterize q vector uh, q sorry q factor for this one uh, also what we are going to do is uh, compared to uh, biconical antenna where we applied boundary condition uh, at, at theta equals to alpha or alpha 1 and alpha 2 now we are going to enforce boundary conditions at some radial distance r equals to a where we have a pec boundary condition so we will see that we will solve that again it's going to be very similar to what we have done for biconical antenna but only the difference is now instead of hankel function you would like to have bessel function to represent waves which are bouncing back and forth in radial direction we will see that so again what we are going to do is uh, this kind of uh, structures support te2r and tm2r type of modes and we will uh, construct solution for both of these modes <coughs> and again we will find the expressions for resonant frequency and q factors so let's start this is our geometry uh, so again your spherical geometry uh, spherical cavity is centered around the center of your coordinate system and it has a radius of a radial dimension is a, a.
So let's start with the TE to R modes. For TE to R mode, as we all know now, uh, that F component F R will be non-zero. All the other components of F F theta and F P will be zero. Similarly, all the components of A vector will be zero. <coughs> so uh, for T E to R modes. This is going to be your uh, eigen function for FR. So in the radial direction, now you have a Bessel function of first kind and Bessel function of second kind, because you want that uh, waves to be bouncing back and forth. It should, it should uh, represent standing waves instead of uh, uh, traveling wave. So we are not going to use the Henkel function. And again, when I say Bessel function, these are not regular Bessel function. These are shock enough spherical Bessel function of first kind and second kind. Again, for theta variation, you are going to have associated legendary function. And for the phi variation, you are going to have cosine and sine theta, uh, sine variation, sorry. Now, again, uh, the uh, allowed values of M and N, something similar to our previous biconical antenna structure. Here you will have M and N, which are integers. Uh, we are going to have fields which should be finite everywhere. That means now, uh, again, uh, if you remember our, from our uh, uh, previous chapter, uh, when we discussed these cylindrical structures with circular uh, symmetry, that uh, circular cross section, uh, that this y uh, of beta r, that is a Bessel function of second kind. In our case, it's a shock enough spherical <laughs> Bessel function of second kind. Uh, that particular function has a singularity at r equals to zero. So when the argument is zero, it has a singularity and we don't want, okay, we don't want to uh, uh, have our fields which explode uh, to infinity at certain point in our geometry. So that's why we are going to enforce one extra additional boundary condition that uh, B1 equals to zero so that we can get rid of this singularity from our eigenfunction. <coughs> Similarly, also as we uh, saw in the last uh, few slides that at theta equals to zero and theta equals to pi, basically your cosine of theta, okay, argument of cosine theta will be uh, one and minus one and we know that uh, at argument equals to one and minus one, this particular uh, legendary function of the second kind will also uh, have a singularity. So we want to also get rid of those singularity at theta equals to zero and theta equals to pi. So what we will do is we will again uh, enforce this d2 equals to zero so that we can also again get rid of this another singularity q m n okay so by doing that uh, again this is a uh, these are the cows for uh, legendary function of first kind p okay and uh, similarly this is a legendary function of the second kind and you can see that when the argument approaches uh, 1 and minus 1 basically this particular function legendary function of second kind as a singularity. So that's why we want to get rid of that uh, particular function so that we have finite field everywhere inside our geometry. We don't want singularities in our field distribution. <coughs> and for TE2 R mode, again, your FR is the only component which is non-zero in vector potentials. And uh, we have, uh, we have uh, only now J N with hat, that means uh, uh, shock enough spherical Bessel function of first kind and also legendary function of first kind for theta variation. Okay. And now again for uh, phi variations, we have both cosine and sine variations. So this individual one vector potential has two modes. Okay. This has two modes. One is a cosine of M phi that is even mode and then sine M phi which will be odd mode, okay? We will say that in the coming slides. <coughs> so we will apply this uh, uh, additional identities or uh, 
properties of uh, legendary functions and as you can see that uh, uh, basically whenever the m is greater than n your this legendary function of first kind will go to zero so it will lead to trivial solution we don't want that so in other words your m should be less than or equal to n that is a one of the condition you have that m has to be less than n also uh, another thing is uh, for each and every value of n okay for each and every value of n you will have infinite value of p you will see that in the coming slides when i will show you the uh, when i will show you the zeros uh, for your bessel function shokanov spherical bessel function when i will show the zeros for them i will uh, show you that for each value of n for each value of order uh, you have infinite values of p okay so this is your reduced eigen function fr and then what we'll do is we will apply again boundary conditions once we find the e and h fill expression so once you have this uh, vector wave potential we uh, use these uh, equations to find corresponding e and h fill so again this is t to r mode so er has to go to zero it has to vanish so er is zero that makes sense and now you have e theta and e phi component for e field for h field you have all three components non zero h r h theta and h phi so what we will do is we will try to enforce this boundary conditions on e field okay because we have p is a boundary condition so tangential component on the uh, on the sphere at r equals to a should go to zero should vanish and as you uh, as we all know e theta and e phi both of these components are tangential to your spherical uh, uh, structure so both of this component e theta and e phi has to vanish at uh, p is a boundary condition at r equals to a so <clears throat> this is your e field again uh, this is a redundant information basically this is the e field what will happen is we will enforce this boundary conditions at r equals to a radial distance r equals to a on the sphere uh, e theta equals to 0 and e phi equals to 0 both of these are tangential component on the sphere so when we apply one of this boundary condition or both of this you will get the same result basically we apply this boundary condition on theta component and when we do that we uh, come up with this expression that the solution uh, or zero uh of the uh shokanov spherical bessel function will lead to the solution or it will give us the uh it will satisfy this equation uh in all, for the non trivial solution and from that basically you can find the eigen values of beta r okay that is wave vector in the r direction radial direction okay so this will be your eigen value and as you can see that n cannot be zero so n starts with 1 and for each value of n let's say n equals to 1 you have infinite value of p okay infinite value of p and the, here this particular kappa sign is nothing but uh, it is uh, zeros of the shokanov spherical bessel function okay shokana spherical bessel function uh, the zero for that is denoted by expressed by this particular symbol okay that's what he has written right it represents the shokana spherical bessel function with the order n order is n for each order you have infinite values of p so when you look at the uh, zeros of this shokanov spherical bessel function you see that uh, the lowest order uh, or lowest value is for n equals to 1 and p equals to 1 and as i i was mentioning for each order let's say n equals to 1 you have infinite values of p you have infinite values of p so this there are infinite number of values for p for each values of n n equals to 1 n equals to 2 n equals to 3 okay so as you can see that uh, the lowest value is uh, occurring for n equals to 1 and p equals to 1 all 
right? So lowest value occurs for n equals to one and p equals to one. That is this four point four nine three. So this is for PE to R mode. This will be your lowest uh, order mode. That is dominant mode. But remember that for each value of n, there are multiple values of n which can allow non-trivial solutions. So for n equals to one, what are the allowed values of m? M values are m equals to zero and m equals to one. So m. So we know that m has to be smaller than or equal to n, right? So if you have n equals to one, then m can be zero and one. And both of these come, uh, both of these provide the non-trivial solution. So there is a degeneracy. Okay, even for the lowest order mode, for the dominant mode, there are two modes which have the uh same resonant frequency or same uh propagation constant or wave vector beta r so based on that this uh, equation this is our uh, uh basically this is our dispersion equation and from that dispersion equation again you can come up with the uh, resonant frequency for your cavity so as you can see that m can be uh from 0 to less than or equal to n and for each value of n also there are infinite values of p okay so this is your resonant frequency and now we will see that uh, because of this you have numerous uh, n number uh, n number of uh, uh, degenerate uh, degenerated modes you have lot of degeneracies and we will see that in the next slide so again uh, something similar to uh, what i just mentioned uh it's the same thing that for each value of n you have infinite values of p and this is going to be your first mode then this is going to be your second mode this will be your third mode okay and so on so first mode will be 1 1 n equals to 1 and p equals to 1 right because the zeros of the uh, shoknov spherical bessel function uh, is basically 4.493 for this particular mode and as i mentioned there are two values of m there are two values of m which are allowed 0 and 1 okay so what will happen that uh, uh, when you have m equals to 0 okay we will see in the next slide i will explain why do we have three modes let me just show that so what happens is uh, basically this was your function uh, reduce the function of your uh, vector wave potential fr now what happens is uh, when your m equals to 0 that means basically this will uh, reduce down to 1 okay this will reduce down to 1 and this will be 0 so you will get rid of this one okay for m equals to 0 and this will go to 1 so you don't have any phi variation okay you don't have phi variation you only have radial variation and theta variation so this represents when m equals to 0 represents the even mode so that is first even mode right that is fr 0 1 1 1 that is even mode since there is no phi variation okay so this will be your vector wave potential for first even mode okay that is first mode now let's look at the other one that when you have m equals to 1 what will happen so now let's look at the m equals to 1 when m equals to 1 right m equals to 1 then you have both the variation of sin m phi that will be sin phi okay this will be sin phi and this will be cosine phi so you have both the variation cosine and sin now if you remember when we uh, express this vector wave potential and mention that since uh, since it has uh, two uh, both of them cosine and sin variation it has inherently two modes one is even mode and the second one is odd mode so this one this cos m phi or cos phi will give us the even mode and this sin phi will give us odd mode so that's what happens when you have m equals to 1 n equals to 1 and p equals to 
right? When you have this M, N, and E, three of all of them are one. Basically, you will have this cos uh, cos <coughs> phi variation, right? Only cos phi variation, and as a result of that, this will be your field distribution. As and as you can see that since you have cos phi, this particular mode is called even mode. Now, similarly. Uh, when you have uh, m equals to one, n equals to one, p equals to one, uh, you can also have phi variation that is sine phi, and this is your odd because you have sine phi variation, so it is called odd mode. So what I'm trying to say is for n equals to one and p equals to one. See here, n and p values are one one, right? N and p are one one. N and p are one one, right? And also here also n and p are one one, right? So basically, for n and p equals to one, you have three modes. You have three modes: one mode for m equals to zero, and two modes for m equals to one. So you have two even mode and one odd mode. So in total, you have three modes with the same resonant frequency. So your dominant mode. Actually has three degenerated modes, uh, and those three modes are m equals to zero even mode, m equals to one even mode, m equals to one odd mode, right? Now when you have n and n and p equals to two one these values, then you can have uh, three values uh, which are allowed for m because m can be less than or equal to n, so m can be zero one two. Now for zero you will have one even mode. Now for one, you will have two modes, even and odd. Also for two, again you will have even and odd mode, right? So in general, uh, in total, this particular resonant frequency will have five modes, right? And when you add these five modes to your another three modes, uh, total modes will be eight. And same thing will go on for this one, where you have again another two modes for m equals to three. And that's why basically you will have another seven modes. So when you add seven plus eight, you will total have fifteen modes, and so on. You go on like this, okay? So you have lots of degenerated modes for this one. And the only difference between this degenerated mode is that field distribution is slightly rotated or slightly uh, changed. So you can see that uh, for this particular mode, for this even mode. Fr one one one. The potential difference, vector potential difference, has a phi variation of cosine phi. Now for this one, Fr one 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 one, odd mode, your phi variations are sine phi. So in the phi direction, your field distribution are going to be rotated by ninety degree. So if you have field rotation, field distribution like this. For the other mode, it will be rotated like by ninety degree. So from cosine phi, it will be sine phi. That's what he is saying. That basically those degenerated modes will have uh, something like this. Field distributions will be rotated by ninety degree in phi direction. Now same thing you can do for TM to R mode. For TM to R mode, uh, as you can see that instead of F, now you have a potential. Again, you apply this boundary conditions. Right. When you apply this boundary condition e theta and e phi, uh, you get the values of uh, <coughs> from your vector potential. You will get the expression for e and r, uh, e and h fields, and h r will be zero since it's a T M to R mode. Right. So uh, you have all other phi components which are non-zero, and you apply that boundary conditions e theta and e phi. At radial distance, r equals to a. When you do that, when you apply these boundary conditions, right, you will again come up with a similar expression. Now the only difference is uh, the solution of this particular uh, uh, vector potential will give you the uh, eigenvalue of uh, beta r, and you will see that basically it satisfies that equation when the Derivation of uh, Shokunov spherical Bessel function is zero. Okay, uh, for TE to R mode, it was Shokunov spherical Bessel function. Here it is derivation uh, or 
I should say differentiation of uh, uh, differentiation of Stokhanov spherical Bessel functions zero will give you the solution or eigenvalue. So now this is uh, nothing but uh, this particular symbol represents the uh, zeros of the derivative of Stokhanov's spherical Bessel function of order n. Okay, and again your n cannot start from zero. Okay, in order to have non-trivial solution, n has to start from one. And again, m, your m value has to be smaller than or equal to n in order to have non-trivial solution. And these are the, uh, this is a table of uh, values of the derivative, zeros for the derivative of the Shogunov spherical Bessel function. Okay, and again for individual value of n, let's say n equals to 1, you have infinite number of values for p. Okay. And this will be your resonant frequency. Again, this is similar to what we have just shown for t to r mode. You can go by yourself. And again, you will have degenerated modes like I explained for t to r mode. Now you have for tm to r, again, you will have degenerated modes. And the field distributions will be slightly different from each other. Okay. So let's uh, solve this one example where uh, basically we, uh, we want to find the resonant frequency for this uh, uh, first three modes and we'll see that what are the uh, resonant uh, frequencies as well as the uh, propagation constant VR. So for the first mode, uh, M equals to zero, N equals to one, P equals to one. Basically, uh, for TM to R mode, AR will be this expression. And uh, what you need to do is you need to find the uh, zeros of this uh, Shokanov spherical Bessel function. Okay. So, for that, uh, what we are going to do is uh, basically, first, what we are doing is we are finding the uh, field distribution for the first mode 0, 1, 1. Then we are finding the field distribution for the 1, 1, 1, m equals to 1, n equals to 1, t equals to 1 with the cosine phi variation that is even mode. Okay, that is for even mode. And similarly for odd mode, we are finding the field distribution. Again, this is not the field distribution, this is a vector wave potential uh, function. And from that, we have to derive the expressions for E field. So once you have that, you can always go and derive the field distribution E and H corresponding to particular vector wave potential function. Also, uh, let's say for this particular uh, example, we have A equals to three centimeter. Epsilon is nothing but vacuum epsilon zero. We want to uh, determine the resonant frequency for the first 11 modes. We want to determine resonant frequency for first 11 modes. So let's uh, do that. So your resonant frequency for TE to R mode is given by this and this is for TM to R mode, right? And again, this is a table for the zeros of the spherical Bessel function. And this is a table for the uh, zeros of the derivative of the spherical vessel function, Sokhanov's uh, spherical vessel function. And from that, uh, you can see that uh, when you find out uh, for first three modes, first three degenerated modes, basically this will be your resonant frequency, okay? By substituting the values of the zeros of the uh, Bessel function, zeros of the a spherical Bessel function or here because it's TM to R mode, it will be zeros of the derivative of the spherical Bessel function. And uh, uh, basically that will be this one. Okay, for these first three modes, they will have the same resonant frequency. Also, why we have TM to R mode first uh, instead of T to R mode? So if you look at this value for uh, zeros of the derivative of Bessel function, it is 2.744, right? So it is lower than the first derivative, first zero of the derivative, uh, first zero of the spherical Bessel function, which is 4.493. So you do that even for the higher order modes. So this will be resonant frequency for the next five modes, right? These are the values of the next five modes. Okay. 
and similarly for the next three modes this will be resonant frequency can okay, these are the three modes okay so you can keep on doing for higher order modes now the next topic is uh, uh, since it's a cavity we are also interested in uh, finding the q factor of your cavity uh, we have already found the resonant frequency now what will be the q factor so for q factor uh, the general uh, definition uh, we have gone through this definition is what uh, it is uh, uh, it is defined by the uh, ratio of stored energy by the dissipated power times the angular frequency so uh, uh, sorry resonant frequency right now here the stored energy you can write that stored energy by total stored energy by stored energy in the e field and then multiply by 2 or you can find that total stored energy by finding the stored energy in magnetic field and then multiplying by 2 okay because uh, energy is equally stored in e and h field okay <coughs> so uh, what we are going to do is based on whichever is the easier way whichever is the easier to find we will select which one we will use from these two equations to find the q factor we will use one of these equations to find the q factor based on our uh, based on our uh, uh, comfort okay whatever is the easier for you uh, for us we will solve that so again this is a typical uh, way of representing q factor so it is a ratio of resonating frequency and the bandwidth of your uh, system so here the resonant frequency is f0 and bandwidth is delta f okay you can define various uh, definite you can define various uh, bandwidth like 3 dB bandwidth or 6 dB bandwidth and based on that uh, you will have different q factors also uh again this is uh, again the same thing that you have this kind of you provide some signal and then uh, you measure it uh, from that you basically get the uh, q factor you define the bandwidth and all resonant frequency and bandwidth you measure that and from that you get the q factor so again for tm2 011 mode this is your first mode e1 mode this is the potential uh, vector wave potential distribution <coughs> and when you apply this boundary when you apply this uh, 011 in this one basically this will be reduced form of your uh, vector wave potential now uh, in order to find the uh, stored energy or dissipated power we need to integrate this uh, we will see that we have to integrate uh, the e field and h field uh, and uh, you will see that the main challenge is to integrate this particular function we know how to integrate cosine theta sin theta function uh, the main challenge is how do we integrate the uh, shocken of spherical bessel function okay and we will see that in coming slides so for tm011 mode this is again this is your reduced eigen function for vector wave potential ar and from that what we see is basically when we derive the expression for e and h field when we derive those expression for e and h field uh, we see that hr is zero and h theta is also zero okay both of these are zero right so only h phi component is non zero for tm2 uh, tm2 011 mode now uh, based on that uh, since we have only one component for h field which is non zero it is uh, obvious that we should use h field in order to find the q factor so we will use energy stored in magnetic field rather than energy stored in electric field because for electric field basically we will have two non zero components we will have two non zero components for e field which are going to be uh, non zero and as a result of that uh, it will be 
slightly more cumbersome or it will be slightly difficult uh, to find q factor using energy stored in e field so what we do is we use the other uh, field h field and find the q factor both will give us the same value so what we do is first we find the stored energy inside the cavity by taking a volume integral okay by taking a volume integral where uh, radius is uh, we are varying from 0 to a okay theta we are varying from 0 to pi okay and phi we are varying from 0 to 2 pi okay and we integrate this uh, at square dv when we do this uh, uh, this will be our uh, energy stored in the electric field as i mentioned that we know that how to integrate this theta okay and we also know how to integrate phi so for this theta and phi it's not a problem problem will be uh, when we integrate dr okay so when we integrate uh, this sin cube theta d theta okay we get this 4 by 3 and for phi we get uh, phi we get 2 pi so where, when we do th those integration we take this 2 pi and 4 by 3 outside the integration basically uh, uh, outside the integration of dr so we are only left with this integration in the radial direction from 0 to a now the <clears throat> we cannot directly uh, find the integration we need to know some kind of identity to, in order to find this kind of integration uh, unless and until you are working on this functions in day to day life it is very difficult to find this kind of uh, integration right so at the end of our textbook there are some identities for the spherical bessel functions okay uh, shogun spherical bessel function and one of the identity is that when you want to find the integral of this uh, you can write down that integral in terms of this expression on the right hand side okay and uh, using this uh, uh, and with this relation between your uh, uh, spherical bessel functions shokara so, uh, spherical bessel function uh, normal or regular spherical bessel function and uh, regular bessel function basically uh, when we substitute this one and this one okay first we use this identity to find the integration in a closed form and then we apply this particular relationship uh, to convert that to regular bessel function and at the end of the uh, book you will see that uh, uh, this values for bessel function is well tabulated so we find the values of bessel function regular bessel function from that table so when we do that uh, we get this values for this uh, uh, j1 j0 and j2 and when we substitute this values in this uh, basically integration okay on the right hand side uh, this will be your final value that is 1.137 divided by beta r so we will substitute that in the final expression so this will be your stored energy inside this spherical cavity okay and similarly uh, for the dissipated power if you remember even for the previous structures when we uh, try to calculate the q factor i mentioned that uh, here when we say dissipated uh, power uh, we are assuming that the material which is filling this cavities Uh, are lossless we consider those materials uh, which are filled inside the cavity uh, as a lossless material and as a result of that there is there is no power dissipated inside the volume most of the or here in our case we are saying that uh, uh, all of the power dissipated uh, all the power dissipation occurs on the surface of your cavity so what we will do is we will try to find the uh, current density on the surface and from that current density we will be able to find the power dissipated by this expression and we have shown this uh, expression even in the previous lectures when we discuss rectangular cavities as well as cylindrical cavities so uh, circular with a circular cross section right so uh, we apply that again we will use the uh, h field obviously to find the surface current density on this uh, surface of the sphere and from that we will get this expression for the surface current density we will substitute that in this power dissipated 
uh, on the surface and when you do that again you have to uh, do integration okay and when you do that uh, all these things uh, uh, basically what will happen here uh, we are at advantage that we don't have to integrate uh, on the in the radial direction we are just integrating on surface which is uh, having only phi and theta variation so we don't have to actually integrate this uh, bessel function you can simply take that outside so when you take integration of this thing uh, you will get this 4 by 3 from the theta variation and 2 pi value from the phi variation and this will be your total dissipated power inside this spherical cavity with these assumptions. Uh, from that, basically, this will be your Q factor. And you can see this is your Q factor's value that 1.004 eta divided by Rs, where eta is nothing but intrinsic impedance. Okay. So, <clears throat> if we compare our Q factor for this spherical cavity with the Q factor of the cylindrical cavity with a circular cross section and uh, rectangular cavity, that is uh, basically a cubical cavity okay uh, cubical cavity so uh, if we compare our uh, uh, q factor for the spherical cavity with those other two geometry you can see that uh, here q factor is given by 1.044 r eta divided by rs now compared to that uh, q factor for the cylindrical cavity with a uh, circular cross section was 0.8017 eta by rs and for the Q factor for the cubical cavity was given by 0 0.7405 eta over Rs. That means uh, spherical cavity has the highest Q factor for a given volume. And again, I mentioned that even in the last lectures when we discussed this or when we compared cylindrical uh, cavity with a circular cross section with the cubical cavity that uh, we need to keep this in mind that when we define the Q factor, we have considered power dissipation only on the surface. And as a result of that, what happened? That uh, uh, the uh, Q factor is proportional to the volume to surface ratio because your energy stored inside the cavity depends on the volume of the cavity, whereas your power dissipated uh, depends on the surface, uh, uh, basically surface area. So if you have that ratio of volume and uh, surface, volume to uh, the surface, uh, then in that case, you will increase your Q factor. So your Q factor is proportional to volume uh, to ra uh, surface ratio, surface area ratio. And uh, we all know that uh, spherical geometry has the lowest or smallest surface area for a given volume. So they have the smallest surface area compared uh, for a given volume uh, because they don't have any corners. They don't have any corners. As a result of that, spherical geometry has the lowest uh, surface area. Uh, and that's why you see that droplets uh, for water, they have a spherical or bubbles have a spherical shape, right? From physics, you know this. So because of that uh, tension, surface tension, it creates a spherical shape. So similarly, because the spherical shape has the smallest surface area, that's why you see the highest Q factor, quality factor. Uh, and with assumption that uh, all the power dissipation occurs on the surface only. The material which you filled inside your cavity is a lossless. We consider that as a lossless and that's why you come up with a conclusion uh, that Q factor is proportional to volume divided by surface. Now, uh, you can take also ratio of uh, uh, the Q factors for uh, uh, spherical cavity and cylindrical cavity. And you can see that uh, spherical cavity has uh, almost 25 percentage more Q factor compared to cylindrical cavity with a circular cross section. Similarly, you can take a ratio of Q factors for spherical cavity and cubical cavity. And you can show that it is almost 35 percentage larger for the spherical cavity. Now, uh, Again, I'm just repeating myself that uh, uh, you should keep in mind that when we are defining uh, uh, or we are concluding uh, uh, to this kind of uh, conclusion, we are uh, assuming uh, there is an inherent assumption that uh, 
uh, all the losses which we are considering are happening only on this surface of the cavity not inside the volume of the cavity okay and uh, with this i think we will end the lecture uh, we will end this chapter here uh, but before that let me show you some of the additional material for the bow tie antenna okay so at the beginning of the lecture i showed you some uh, simple or some slides a basic material on the bow tie antenna uh, there is a recent paper by professor balanis and his student on this flexible bow tie antenna is design simulation fabrication and testing in transaction of antennas and we are going to just uh, i'm go just going to give some glimpse of uh, what this uh, paper presents so uh, basically this is a bow tie antenna again this is a extension or 2d uh, version of your biconical antenna and as i mentioned basically uh, similar to bow uh, biconical antenna uh, you expect this bow tie antenna to be slightly uh, or it should be broadband antenna compared to dipole antenna conventional dipole antenna now this is a geometry of bow tie antenna and as i mentioned that uh, dipole antenna or this kind of bow tie antenna they are the balanced system they are balanced device on the other hand if you have uh, something like this as a feeding line which is unbalanced then you require a transition which can connect your balance system to unbalanced system uh, or device balance uh, device to unbalanced device and for that you require something called balance okay and that is nothing but balance to unbalance okay it's a short form of a balance to unbalance and uh, that kind of uh, converter is called nothing but balance now also when we look at the current distribution surface current distribution on antennas uh, we can understand uh, we can gain lot of insight about the structure what is going on inside the structure why it is behaving like in particular fashion so here you can see that when you look at the current distribution surface current distribution on this bow tie antenna you can see that most of the current distribution is located or focused in the Uh, towards the edges okay so uh, most of the current is confined in the edges of your bow tie antenna okay inside the edges or uh, near the edges so as a result of that uh, what we can do is all this part all this center part is useless so what we can do is we can remove that uh, from your antenna and see whether it uh, affects your performance of your antenna or not so when we remove that and this is the uh, basically substrate which we is uh, which is used basically uh, polyethylene and naphthalate uh, for uh, nothing but a plastic uh, for this uh, substrate for the antenna uh, it's a flexible antenna so you have this kind of substrate which can be uh, basically bent so uh, again this is a bow tie antenna with a balloon uh, balloon and uh, as you can see that uh, again most of the current is uh, focused near the edges okay uh, confined near the edges so what we will do is uh, we can remove that center portion like this as shown in this geometry and when you do that uh, what will happen ideally it should not affect your performance of an antenna so uh, you can see that uh, this is the outline bow tie antenna so outline bow tie antenna is nothing but uh, you remove this center portion so this is your outline bow tie antenna and when you do that uh, this is your uh, uh, return loss for outline bow tie antenna and this is a radiation pattern in the h plane e plane in both e planes uh, one is the xy plane okay and this is the yz plane and uh, when you compare the results of your solid bow tie antenna with a uh, outline bow tie antenna you can see that uh, both the outline bow tie antenna and solid bow tie antenna has a very good uh, matching uh, around 7.5 gigahertz also notice that outline bow tie antenna resonates at slightly lower frequency compared to your original solid bow tie antenna and the reason behind that is basically what happens is when you remove this center part from your bow tie antenna now you are enforcing all of your current to flow through this longer path okay so now your current is flowing uh, through this longer path 
so effective length of your bow tie antenna will increase so if you increase the effective length of your bow tie antenna basically resonating frequency will reduce and that's why for outline bow tie antenna the resonating frequency is slightly smaller than the original bow tie solid bow tie antenna so since in the original bow tie antenna uh, let me just clear out this screen so that it's not confusing so in the original bow tie antenna you can also see some current distribution here also in the center right so effectively uh, it's slightly smaller antenna compared to outline bow tie antenna and as a result of that basically uh, its resonant frequency is slightly higher than the outline bow tie antenna and that's why you see this behavior uh, that uh, basically outline bow tie antenna has a smaller resonating frequency compared to solid bow tie antenna okay and this is the reference uh, uh, is a publication transaction of antenna propagation uh, in uh, december 2011 okay so we will end our lecture uh, 17 here and from next lecture onward uh, from lecture 18 we will start uh, discussing scattering from the structures canonical structures i will also explain you what is rada cross section and how it uh, uh, why it is why it is so important uh, i will also discuss about stealth uh, radar invisibility and all those things uh, i have covered this materials uh, briefly when i talk about meta surfaces in chapter 8 uh, in the previous lectures but uh, now in the, from next lecture onwards we will go in a proper detail and we will derive expressions for radar cross section from the canonical structures okay so uh, thank you for attending this lecture and stay safe stay home thank you